Hello, I'm Melanie Bunn. I am a registered nurse and a consultant um, and trainer with Dementia Alliance of North Carolina. And I am so excited to be here with you to talk about stress and to talk about your brain on stress. And we're talking about your stress and we're talking about their stress and we're talking about the stress of people living with dementia. We are talking about stress and your brain on stress. Now, let's start off by backing up a little bit and realizing that stress isn't always bad. The reason most of us get up in the morning is because of stress, whether it's physiological stress, you know what I'm talking about, or whether it's time stress. We get up and we get going and it's kind of about stress. So stress of a wedding, stress of a new baby, stress of, of a holiday or a vacation, stress isn't all bad. It's how we react and respond to it. So what we're gonna talk about in this session is how we develop that bad stress and, and what can we do about it. So let's start with some science. The science is that we get information in and we get information in from our eyes. We get information in from our ears. We get information in from our nose. We get information in from our mouth. We get information in from our skin. We get information in from that, that spidey sense, that anticipation, that instinct and reflex that something isn't right. So we get sensory information in. That information goes to your thalamus and your thalamus sends it up and your thalamus sends it over and it sends it over to your core primitive brain. And in your core primitive brain are some structures that are wired to respond quickly. It's a short path. And those structures are wired to have a quick response. So those structures are things like your hippocampus, which is where a lot of your memory functions and a lot of your understanding time functions and a lot of your familiar unfamiliar even even some of your visual spatial like getting lost finding your way back kind of functions are so it goes there and that part of your brain its job is to say we've seen this before it's not good we've seen this before it's okay that's that part of the brain in this strut situation the second part in that primitive brain is your amygdala and your amygdala their job is to have a fight fright flight reaction i'm gonna run away i'm gonna freeze and maybe it'll go away i'm gonna fight my way out so that amygdala has that fast response fight fright flight survive thrive i like it i don't like it i want it i need it that amygdala is important we need to have those responses we need to have that rush that the amygdala gives us. We need to have that rush of that hippocampus going familiar, unfamiliar. That is important, we need that. The second place it goes, it goes to those primary primitive brain reflex kind of places and they go, it's dangerous, it's not familiar, it's scary. Then the other place that the hippocamp, uh, the, um, the thalamus sends that information to is to the frontal lobe. Now the frontal lobe is right here. It's the prefrontal cortex. This is the part of the brain where your logic and your reason is housed. This is the part of your brain where your ability not to react, but to decide. So your primitive brain is react. Your frontal lobe is decide. So your frontal lobe takes the information from the, high, um, the, the thalamus, but also from the amygdala, from the hippocampus, from other parts of the brain, and it sorts through it, and it organizes it, and it puts it together, and it says, something to worry about, this is okay. Something to worry about, this is okay. Okay, I'm backing off, this is dangerous, amygdala, take it away. It's all yours, or not such a big deal. So, so let's, let's dig into this and talk a little bit more specifically about what should happen and what does happen sometimes. So what happens is there is a threat. And that might be something you see or you hear or you feel, like we talked about just a bit ago. There's a threat and so you have an action. 
So that action might be run away, or it might be hide, or it might be fight your way out. There's a threat, there's an action, and success. Because of your action, the threat was resolved. And now that that threat is resolved, everybody back to baseline. That's how it's supposed to act. So, I see a child who is about to fall down the steps. It's a threat. Not to me, but it's a threat to my family. It's a threat to my child. It's a threat to survival. I have an action. I run and I my amygdala goes up. My hippocampus goes. This is not, this has happened before. Kids get hurt this way. My lid goes dan my middle goes danger, danger, danger. The frontal lobe goes, yeah, little kid, big steps. We grab the kid and we pull the kid to safety. The threat is resolved. Everyone back to baseline. That's the way it's supposed to work. That's the way it's supposed to work. But the challenge is it doesn't always work that way. And sometimes it doesn't work that way because of things we as care partners do. Sometimes it doesn't work that way just because of the way life and, and environments and societies are now. Sometimes it doesn't work that way because... Um, of the abilities or the losses of the person living with dementia. Sometimes it doesn't work that way because what we're thinking is a misunderstanding or misinterpretation. So what we think is a threat isn't really a threat. But what when it doesn't work, the action that doesn't work is there's a threat. It's a threat, it's a threat, and I do something. And I do something. And I do something. And I do something. And it doesn't help. I do something and I'm, I'm fighting or I'm fighting or I'm flying or maybe I start out with trying to run away but I'm tied and I'm not allowed to run away or I don't, my legs don't work, I can't run away or maybe I try to hide but people keep coming and saying, Melanie, Melanie, you're not supposed to be in here or maybe that gets to the point that the fighting, the fighting and the flighting doesn't work so now I start trying to fight my way out and that doesn't work either. And so my brain keeps trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. My body keeps trying and trying and trying and trying and trying to make the threat go away. But either there isn't a threat that's real that I can take care of, or I don't have the abilities to manage the threat, or I don't have the resources. I'm not being allowed, maybe to manage the threat, and so there's no resolution. And when that's the situation, we develop these pathways. We develop these pathways that start to kind of super highway the sensory experience to that really strong, I've got to escape. So there's an old saying, it was first attributed to uh, a scientist named Donald Hebe, and he said, neurons that fire together, wire together. Neurons that fire together, wire together. What he really meant was, if our brain gets used to doing things in certain paths, it becomes more efficient. That's a good thing in most situations. So just like you don't have to, when you're first learning to drive, when you're first learning to drive, you have to think, okay, if I want to turn left, I do the turn signal like that. If I want to turn right, I do the turn signal. Now, you don't even have to think about it. You go to turn, it just happens automatically, unless you have your hands in your lap. And what you'll notice, if you put your hands in your lap with me, and if I say, which way does the turn signal go to turn right, your hand will come up and you'll actually try it before you can remember it. Try it sometime and see. You can't do it without your hands. Because those neurons have fired together so often, they're wired together. You don't need to think. You don't need to figure it out. It's an automatic kind of thing. Firing together, wiring together is wonderful in this situation because it means I don't have to think about that. That part is automatic. It's wired together. I don't have to think about it. Driving in the, in the United States, driving on the right side of the road, 
the literal right side of the road, not the figurative right side, although some of us would say, but anyway, driving on, that is a wire together, a fire together, wire together thing. We're just going to do that. We don't they have to think about when I turn left. I don't have to think about which lane to get into, but if I'm in a situation where it's different, I'm going to have to figure it out. So this fire together, wire together is really, really helpful for survival unless it's going back to this situation I just discussed. When my brain, my body, my, my, I have a sensory threat. This is scary, this is threatening. I try and I try and I try to protect myself and I'm not able to protect myself and it becomes really connected. They wire together and now what happens is every time someone pushes my wheelchair past the bathroom or the shower room. Help, 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 help. Woo, woo, baby, help me, help me, help me. Don't, 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 don't. Or every time somebody comes up to me with an incontinence pad. Because what happens is that sensory experience of some of those frightening, scary, overwhelming, threatening, intimidating threats where I couldn't protect myself. I couldn't keep it from happening. So I tried and I tried and I tried. It didn't have a resolution. So now I've almost built up this fire together, wire together into almost kind of a PTSD kind of experience. So now every time someone wearing certain color clothes comes in, I get really scared or I get really angry and frustrated. Or now every time my daughter walks in, I get, because I know she's going to talk to me about not driving anymore. You know, every time she comes in, she tells me she's worried about my driving. Every time the threat is I hear my daughter telling me not to drive, I can't do anything to make my driving better. I can't do anything to make my daughter start stop talking about it. It fires together, it wires together. Now, every time my daughter comes in, Lord, won't you go away, just stop nagging me. And so now, instead of it building to a level where I'm distressed, we go from daughter walks in to distressed. So what can we do about this? Because it's not enough just to define the problem. It's not enough to just talk about what happens in our brain and our brain on stress. What are we going to do something? What are we going to do about it? That's the magic word. Do something. Because if that person does something that feels like he or she is protecting him or herself or does something that feels like now I can control this, then we don't build those same connections of danger, danger, if this, then this. If I see this, I, I respond this way. So if I have some sense of control, some sense of being able to impact what's happening to me, then those neurons don't wire together, fire together in that PTSD way. And I have some control. It doesn't go so bad. So what might some of those doing things might be? Some of it might be, um, I can say no. No, I don't want that. No, I don't want that. No, I don't want that. Giving that person some control over it. No. Hearing no. Respecting no. People living with dementia have a right to say no. And truthfully, things will go better when we respect their no. So give that person the, the control that they, that they really own, which is their no. Give, empower that person to have that control. Empower that person to make some choices. You're not in, this is not work. You don't want to do this. I understand. I understand. This is not what you want to do. Okay, I got it. Is it, is it worse because it's here or is it worse because it's this? 
So giving that person some control. What's the worst thing? Okay, so if that's the worst thing, how could we take this thing and make it a little bit better? So for example, if the person gets really distressed, I don't want to take a shower. I don't want to take, no, 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 don't. Back off, change something, and, and, and re-empower that person with their control. Let's try it a different way. So maybe we don't ever have to go in the shower again. People all over the world get clean and never go in the shower. People can get clean standing at sinks. People can get clean in their bed with a towel bath. People can get clean just washing between their legs sitting on the toilet. We want people to be clean, but we don't want people to be frightened. We want people to be clean, but we don't want people to be so mad that they develop PSD and they don't want it. And every time they see the bathroom, now they're like this. Take a deep breath. Because here's a secret. It's not just people living with dementia. It's us as well. Because if every time I go to see my mom, I know we're going to argue about the car. And I know we're going to argue about driving. When I get to the door, what happens to me? I'm dealing this as a sensory experience I'm at my mom's door. I know she's going to say no. I'm so worried about her. I'm so afraid of her that she's going to get hurt. My emotions start to go up. I start trying to do something, do something, do something, and I don't have the ability to take an action. I try to action. I say, I try, I threaten, I, I cry, I plead. There's no resolution. It's not working. We've got to back off. We've got to change something, and we've got to try again, and it may even be we need to back completely off this issue. If we have wired together and fired to get, fired together and wired together so intensely that that's all, we might have to just back off of that for a while. Take a few deep breaths. Build some other connections through some situations. Build some pleasant memories because here's the secret that amygdala just doesn't respond to scary things. That amygdala responds to pleasurable things. That amygdala responds to getting needs met. That amygdala responds to beautiful music. That amygdala responds to, to um, favorite foods. That amygdala responds to somebody not fussing at me that I love. That amygdala, so we rebuild some of those fire together, wire together connections that aren't scary and negative. We build some of those positive ones. And then when we go back to reconnect in some of those other ways, take a deep breath and let it go. We've got some ways to reconnect. So let's review just a minute. We've got a sensory experience. It goes to the thalamus. It goes down to the primitive brain up to this intentional brain, there's a threat. We try to react, we try to respond, we act, and if we can resolve the threat, then we return to our baseline. But when we don't get that opportunity, we wire together, we fire together and wire together some really negative responses. So what we can do is rebuild some positive experiences. What we can do is return some of that control to the person living with dementia. Return their control, return their choice, return some of those positive experiences and take a deep breath. Try something different. So hopefully this has offered you maybe some different ways to thinking about this. Hopefully this has offered you some different strategies. Give it a try. If you need more information, if you need more education, or if you need resources or referrals or support, reach out to Dementia Alliance of North Carolina. Thank you for being with me.